two, one. Okay. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I am Fanta Boijang. I'm a program manager at the North Central London Cancer Alliance. And um, I'll be speaking very briefly and then handing over to Dr. Anita Lim, who is um, the chief investigator of the Ustream study. And um, we'll also have Mairead Lyons, a, a senior consultant to the study, both of whom are from King's College London. So just to give you a very brief overview of um, how the study came about, um, the Cancer Alliance, for those who are not familiar with Cancer Alliances, um, were or have been mandated by NHS England to improve our coverage of um, cancer screening across the three programmes. Um, cervical screening um, is very much a big part of that. So over the last couple of years, we have been working with King's College London um, to devise the study in order to be able to look at the best way of improving coverage um, across North Central London, North East London, and just the wider programme, um, because this particular study will have benefits to the wider programme. Um, we used to be one alliance, so North Central and North East London used to be one up until April, where we split. And um, because of the fact that the study had started before that time, um, we have continued to work together in partnership. Um, this particular study is going to be running in Barnet, Camden, Islington, Newham and Tower Hamlets. Um, as Anita talks you through it, you will see that um, we have worked really hard to embed it as best as possible within the screening programme. And that's because the aim of it is to test the pathway or is to test a couple of pathways within the screening programme um, to see how feasible it will be to implement self-sampling within the wider screening programme in England. Um, there's a lot of support for this um, project and um, already we've had a lot of interest and in, in sign up from across the five boroughs. Um, NHS England, NHS Digital, Public Health England um, have all been very involved in the design of the study and um, they'll also be involved in supporting the rollout of it um, once we do begin. So Anita will take you through um, the greater detail of the study design and um, what it would involve for GPs to take part and um, any questions that you do have, please do put it in the chat as we go along and um, we'll leave enough time later on to um, take any questions. All right, I'll hand over to Anita now. Thank you, Fanta. So thank you and hello everyone. So I'm Dr Anita Lim. I'm a senior epidemiologist at the uh, Cancer Prevention Trials Unit in King's College London and I'm going to take us through an overview of the HPV cell sampling trial that is called Uscreen. So Uscreen represents a really radical shift in our approach to cervical screening that we hope will make it more accessible and acceptable to women. And just before we get started, I'd like to point out that although these days cervical screening is often thought of as a nurse-led activity in, in GP primary care, because self-sampling kits will be handed out opportunistically in new screen by uh, GPs and healthcare assistants, they will also have a really important role. So cervical screening coverage in England has been falling for over two decades, and this happens across all age groups. We were at a 21 year low until late last year where we saw a very small increase in coverage. And this is really off the back of a, a large national campaign which was designed to drive cervical screening attendance rates up, uh, the Cervical Screening Saves Lives campaign, but it only achieved a really small increase. London consistently has the lower cervical screening coverage nationally, despite continued investment to drive uptake. And in some areas, we've got almost half of women who aren't currently coming. So the rationale for use screen is clear. We know that un- and underscreened women are at the highest risk of developing cervical cancer. In terms of screening barriers, we know that many women who aren't currently coming for their screening have a fear or dislike of the pelvic examination or the speculum. There might be religious or cultural reasons why women don't come. And there's also practical barriers such as difficult getting appointments and busy lifestyles that can be important and presumably even more so in big cities like London. Now, fortunately, self-sampling can address all of these barriers. Studies have already shown that offering self-sampling can increase uptake in non-attenders, and this generally occurs across all socio-demographic groups, which means that self-sampling has a really good chance of to hopefully address the inequalities in screening that we've seen. It's also highly acceptable to women, and women really like it, and they prefer it over clinician sampling. 
So what exactly is self-sampling? So most of you here will be aware that cervical screening in this country has moved on from cytology to HPV testing. And one of the key advantages of HPV testing is that unlike cytology, you don't need intact cervical cells in order to get a good sample because we're looking for the HPV DNA virus and the virus will spread from the cervix throughout the entire genital tract. It allows um, us to collect a good sample for HPV testing uh, just by taking a vaginal sample. So self-sampling allows women to take their sample for cervical screening in private at a time and place of their choosing and they don't need an appointment or to be examined. And this is very much like your uh, self-sampling chlamydia pathway. But this is also why that it addresses most screening barriers. In terms of the test accuracy, self-samples have similar accuracy to clinician or nurse taken samples for detecting SYN2+. Now, standard cervical screening tests for HPV testing taken by a doctor or nurse are still the most accurate, but self-samples are only marginally less good. And the key message here is that self-samples are reliable and effective for cervical screening. So now on to screen. USCREEN is a pragmatic implementation feasibility clinical trial of offering HPV cell sampling to cervical screening non-attenders within the NHS cervical screening program. So our ambition in USCREEN is to test the end-to-end -end pathways for introducing uh, cell sampling to non-attenders within the program as an integrated service. We also want to be able to generate lessons that will be ensuring a smooth transition for a national or a London-wide rollout and to start to provide the evidence base for how best to implement self-sampling at scale in England. We want to be able to estimate the expected increase in uptake and coverage associated with self-sampling, including plus detection rates. Now, our target population in screen will be women aged 25 to 64 who are eligible for cervical screening and they must be at least at, uh, six months overdue. So this is a non-attender population. Uh, the study is going to run across five boroughs in North Central and East London. All of the samples will be tested by the London Laboratory for Cervical Screening, which is uh, HSL. Uh, the sampling device will be a simple flock swab and it's going to be transported dry and stored at room temperature. Now we plan to recruit women over a 12 month period. So we're including the five boroughs across NCL with the lowest cervical screening coverage. So these are Camden, Islington, Barnet, Newham and Tower Hamlets. And we'll be inviting all GP practices to take part. And we anticipate that we'll probably get about 50% signing up. So about 100 GP practices to take part in our study. Now we'll be offering kits in two different ways. And the first is a systematic offer. So women who reach the 15 month anniversary of the last test due date in NHES, the National Screening Programme database, they will be sent out a letter and telling them that they will be receiving a self sampling kit. And about a week later, they will receive a kit in the post. The second is an opportunistic offer in GP primary care. So women who are at least six months overdue their screening according to the GP record will be flagged by the GP software. So GPs, nurses and healthcare assistants will be asked to fl uh, offer flagged women kits when they consult for any reason. And women can choose between sampling in clinic or taking kits home. Now because of COVID, kits will also be offered opportunistically during virtual or telephone consultations and then they'll just be posted out to women using envelopes um, that the study team will provide. Uh, if your GP practice participates, you'll be doing both of these pathways. Now, this is just to show you the timing of the use screen kit offer. Now, the 15 month time point has been selected so that it specifically avoids the call recall invitation letters and the reminder letters so that it's a really clear letter to the women offering them a self sampling uh, kit and that they know that it's not just another reminder letter or another invitation. I also want to point out here that at six months overdue, these women would have already ignored their invitation and the reminder letter. Now the use screen cell sampling kits are going to include everything that a woman needs to collect and return her sample to the laboratory for testing. So they're going to have both written and pictorial instructions for how to take the sample, patient information leaflet on the study itself, and a lab laboratory request uh, consent form. And they'll also have a, a pre-addressed free post envelope, which will be directed straight to the lab that they can return their sample in, in just the normal Royal Mail post. Now, I know that many of you have a diverse population and will need translated materials and will have the key study material fully translated in the top five languages um, in your patches for the, on the study website. 
there's also going to be a short survey that um, which will be included in the kits. And with the survey, we're just seeking to find out more about women who take up the offer of self sampling and asking them about their previous barriers to participation and then their future screening intentions. We're also asking women who don't return a self sample to complete a survey. So we because uh, we hope to find out more about the reasons for not wanting to take up the offer. So in terms of the clinical pathway, all women will receive their results in the post uh, for their self samples and GP practices will receive results in the usual uh, via the usual electronic pathways. So most women will test HPV negative on a self sample, about 85% of women we expect to test HPV negative and these women will simply be uh, have their next test due date reset and they'll be invited at the next screening round as per usual according to their age. Women who test HPV positive, we expect around 15% of women to test positive on a self sample. They will uh, be advised in their results letter that they need to come and book into the GP practice for a conventional screening test as a follow up test. And then they will be managed according to that uh, follow up test result, which is actually will be the HPV primary screening program. Now, this is currently one of the drawbacks of self sampling, the fact that women who test HPV positive on a self sample do need to come in for a follow up test and a clinician taken sample. Uh, but fortunately, the compliance of this that we've seen in previous studies is really high. So you get about 82% of women quite happily coming in after an HPV uh, positive on a self sample. So these women will actually also be added to the uh, to have a recall within the NHS program so that they will get reminder letters to come for this follow-up test and you will get it they will be added to your PL as well so um, they can have this follow-up test straight away as well they don't need to wait for cells to regenerate because it's an HPV DNA test a very small proportion of women will have an unavailable or rejected sample uh, so usually it's about less than one percent and these women uh, will simply get seen to repeat kit in the post and again we've seen compliance to this is really quite high. So what will practices need to do in terms of their involvement for Uscreen? One of the key things that you'd need to do is nominate a Uscreen study lead. Now this could actually be um, a GP or an HCA or you might want an administrator to take this role, but really they'd need to be championing the study. So they really need to understand the purpose of the study and the design. They'd need to be cascading the information about the study to, the, to your colleagues and to new staff, and they need to be the main point of contact for the study team. Uh, they'd also need to manage the opportunity offered kits within the practice. Uh, you'd also need to attend study training, which will be arranged as about a 30 minute webinar at the moment. Uh, your practice would need to offer the kits opportunistically during consultations for eligible women. Uh, and you'd also need to enter the HPV self sampling results in the usual way. Uh, that you normally do your cervical screening results, so coded into EMIS. Uh, you'd also need to be responsible for clinical management of women who return a self sample, and you'll probably need to answer clinical questions that women may have, but we'll provide full training for this. Now, as I mentioned, the vast majority of women will be testing HPV negative on a self sample, and they won't need any further action. So although you'll be responsible for the clinical management, it's be about 15% of your patients who actually return a sample. Now, at the end of the study, we're also asking women, uh, GP practice as an extra safety net to just to do a mop up of all the HPV positive women on a cell sample who haven't yet come for their um, follow up sample. And all we'd be asking you to do is to make one further contact uh, attempt to see if they would come in for that follow up test. Uh, the practice would also need to give permission to collect pseudonymized GP record data from the study team. Um, and you'll also be pleased to hear that self sampling has been accepted uh, onto the next QOF business rule. So you will receive QOF payments for your uh, self samples, and this will allow you to really get your coverage up and, and hopefully to improve your CQC ratings as well. Now, the study is on the NIHR portfolio, so you will also receive study support costs and remuneration for taking part. Now, in terms of next steps, uh, the study start is planned for November this year. Uh, we've already sent out an expression of interest form, which you should receive via your CCG bulletin email last Friday. Um, but here's the link if you would like to complete the expression of interest survey. Um, I wanted just to show here because we've actually had a really good response already. We've had about 80, uh, 80 GP practices who've already signed up. I knew I'm particularly interested, but if you're from Barnet or Tower Hamlets, we'd really encourage you to sign up. 
Um, and the other thing really with the next steps is just to spread the word uh, within your practices and, and to all the relevant people. Um, there's also some further information that we've currently got on the Small C website, which we can put into the chat um, with a short video if you wanted to see it to explaining more about the study. But finally, I'd just like to um, thank you and welcome any questions. So I can see from the chat that we've got a number of different questions that have come up. Um, so just to just to add to what Anita has said, we've got a link there which takes you to the expression of interest form, which we will circulate and um, we'll circulate all the information as well. So if, if you would like a copy of the slides, we can share that with you. But we've got more detailed information and um, the video that we've developed as well as information on the Cancer Alliance website for NCL and in East London on the East London Health and Care Partnership website. We've also got additional information in there, but we'll, we'll send all of those to you so that you can um, have a read of it. Um, so Anita, um, just looking at one of the first questions that has come up, um, is there already evidence on changed uptake rates on self-sampling in different groups? Uh, sorry, in, well, I'm just going to ask you about it. So in different groups, meaning different sorts of populations, I suppose, like in I, I would assume so um, they haven't really elaborated on that question so definitely as a as a blanket we've already seen lots of evidence that self sampling increases uptake that's no question there's a lot of robust evidence around that there's also studies that have shown um, it's a bit mixed so there's also generally speaking there's studies that show that across low socioeconomic groups particularly from Canada we've seen a lot of data showing that they are able to increase uptake in hard to reach groups. Um, and I think also the, if you look at the, the there's a meta-analysis, an international meta-analysis that's published by Arvind Tron and the BMJ or the BJC 2018 that actually makes reference to what we see across socio-demographic groups in terms of uptake and that generally speaking we do see across all socio-demographic groups in terms of uptake when you offer self-sampling and this is generally in a non-attender population that all the data is produced on. Okay, um, and then there's a, the next question is, um, can a physician associate be the lead in the practice? And I would say, yes, they, they should be able to be the lead. Um, but I would presume we would want somebody who would be in the practice at least in the, during the course of the study, rather than somebody that would only be around for a few months, um, unless they're able to hand over to somebody else who can, who can be the lead from that point on. Um, I already mentioned about the promotional materials, which we will circulate. Um, and then, of course, there's a question as well about will the res results be on Open Exeter, which it will be. Yes. Um, what are the five languages? I must admit, I should know this off head by now <laughs> myself, but I believe um, we've got Bengali, Turkish, um, Polish, I think, and the other two I will have to check, I'm afraid. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head either, but um, we will have those all available on the Small C website. And the Small C website has an additional functionality where it offers um, text to speech. So if people don't actually read, they, they can have the text um, spoken back to them. Um, and that's available in 33 languages. Um, and the next question is, does the questionnaire collect protected char characteristics, digital inclusion, ethnicity and advocacy need? I'm not 100% sure, but I think no. So I don't think we're collecting that sort of detail. So what was it? It was digital advocacy. Digital inclusion. That it definitely digital inclusion. Yeah. No. Ethnicity. And ethnicity, we will be collecting that data. Yes. And sorry, what was the other one? Protected characteristics. Which is defined as? It's uh, quite broad, but some of it is around disability. And, and I, I don't no, think we're collecting that. No, we won't be. I mean, as a research group in general, we're interested in this actually, and it's something we really take up to smaller studies. Yeah. Does the GP practice actively have to ask to sign up? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, we will send you the expression of interest form, um, the link to the form to complete it. You only need to complete the form once. If somebody from your practice has completed it on your behalf, you don't need to do it again. How do we know if my GP surgery is registered as we have already sent the form but haven't received confirmation? 
Um, you should have received an automatic reply. Um, if you haven't, please do send us details of your practice. So your practice name and your practice code if you have it, and then we can check on our system and we'll, we'll send you a response. Um, so Anita, next one is, can you clarify um, more than six months and 15 months you test? I think they just want the distinction between the two pathways, between the um, opportunistic and the mail out. Yeah, so the general eligible population are women who are at least six months overdue for their screening. Now, the 15 months is so those women would all be eligible for an opportunistic offer. So when they came into their GP practice or consulted for any reason at this point, it might be virtual or telephone. They they'd be flagged by EMIS web and that they'll be eligible to be offered a self-sampling kit. Now the 15 month is really a systematic way. So that's just sort of an opportunistic way approach to giving out kits, but obviously you're not going to get everyone who's eligible coming into the practice. So we're using two approaches in that way. So the systematic approach is a way of just any woman when they reach the 15 month anniversary. So that means that they're actually 15 months overdue for their test that they will be identified by NHS and when they're at that time point they're going to be sent this kit and they won't be um, eligible this is going to be sent out to them directly in the mail and they won't actually be sent another kit in the post but they'd still be eligible for an opportunistic offer for example but it's really just to make a distinction between two ways of offering kits so you've got an opportunistic offer where if you happen to go to the practice and you're at least six months overdue you could be eligible and offered a kit and 15 month a woman who are really quite overdue and it's just a way of being able to send them out a kit in a systematic way um, and they'd only be eligible at that 15 month anniversary so once they hit 16 months they're not going to be sent another kit in that way it's just the direct mail out is just a one-time thing during the study yep. and then the next question is how long will the study be for practices that participate so at the moment, we are, what we're planning for is a 12 month recruitment period in total. Now, because this is a pragmatic trial and we really have to see um, what happens. And as you all know, that there's a lot of changes that are consistently happening with us that can affect the way that we might actually run the study. But I think it's probably fair to say that it would be a minimum of three months and a maximum of 12 months. I think that's probably what will happen. Um, just it really depends on logistics, but this is what I think the plan would be. So um, that's what it's looking like at the moment. Katie correct me, can correct me if that's completely wrong, but I think that's right. Yeah, that's great, thank you. And how, when will we receive the test swabs and other information? So uh, we're just collating, we're just collating information at the moment in terms of uh, practices that are willing to take part. And once we've completed that, I think we're going to end, close that off at the end of next week. And so once we've got a full list of all the practices that are willing to participate, we're going to start um, organising for a study start, which will be in November, and we'll have to stagger it just because it's a lot of work to set up that many GP practices. Once you have been confirmed as your date for starting, so the study team will get in contact with you to let you know what date we're planning to start your practice. We'll be arranging for your um, site initiation visits so the training webinar, and only once you've had that would you be receiving the kits and you'll be receiving more information about when you'll get your kits and et cetera, um, really once you express your interest and we, we start, start getting going and, and know close to the time when you're going to be starting at your individual practice. So there's a subsequent um, question to that. How will these kits be ordered? Uh, for the GP practices, I'm assuming they mean. So what will happen when your study, when your when you when your practice starts in the study, you will be sent um, a batch of kits. So we'll do an estimate based on the number of clinic rooms, so that you've got a good supply. Um, and we don't take up too much of your storerooms. Um, so we'll send you basically a batch at the beginning. And then what will we expect them to see that as the study goes along? You know, if you find that you've got excellent recruiters, you might need to be reordering kits, but there'll be a process in place for you to reorder those kits. I think it's probably just, a, I think, an email system, but we'll give you full details once you provide the training um, at your SIV. Um, and there's one more question around um, the swab. How effective are the swab test results? Um, so 
The, the international evidence, um, if you compare it to a your standard clinician sample, is actually really, really strong. So if you want to get really specific about it, we all the studies are showing um, that the sensitivity, so your ability to pick up someone who actually has SIN2 plus with a uh, self-sampling swab, is very, very good. So it's excellent. And it's really, um, it's very similar to what you would see with your normal standard cervical screening test. Uh, what we, the specificity, so um, I guess your ability to correctly identify women who actually don't have SIN2 plus is slightly less good than the clinician taken sample. But because we triage with an HPV, we triage all the HPV positives. So you just might have a few more HPV positives than you would with a clinician sample. Then, um, there's no issue with that per se. I think the bottom line that we would like to say is that it is a really accurate test and the, and the international data on it is really robust. So we're confident in the accuracy of that test. Okay, uh, so next question is, what about patients who say they are not sexually active? So I presume they're asking whether these patients can, can take part. Uh, so the answer to that is yes, and that's sort of up to you in a way. I mean, it's the same question broadly for cervical screening, isn't it? Like, do you, what's the advice that you give to women who are not sexually active or who have never been? And it's really, um, it's a personal decision. They can still have it if they would like it. And definitely cervical screening, if, if they're saying that they're just currently not active, or we would definitely recommend if you're overdue for your screening, then you should certainly be having your cervical screening because it's, you know, uh, the, because the HPV virus is something, you know, you can develop abnormalities over a very long period of time. So the natural history of the disease means that you could have an infection a really long time ago and only much later down the line do you see that you've got some abnormalities there. So certainly anyone who's eligible for cervical screening and who has had sexual activity in the past should be having their screening. It doesn't matter if they're not having um, a lot of sexual activity at the moment. Uh, so there's a question about, is there a minimum number of patients that each practice needs to have to participate? And um, the answer to that is no. So it doesn't matter what your list size is, you can register to participate. Um, and there's also questions around how do we sign up and contact information? We will send that to you um, after the webinar. So there'll be a link to the expression of interest form that you can um, complete. And there'll also be an email address as well if you have any questions. Um, can we request, so this is another question, can we request the kits to be posted to individual patients rather than the whole population in one go? Uh, oh, go for it. Yeah, so um, just for people to understand that the mailing out of the kits happens separate to the practice because we have been working closely with the screening program um, NHS Digital has been able to identify uh, the women who are 15 months overdue and each, mo each month we will do a direct mail out to those women in those five CCGs. So there you don't have to worry about that group in terms of posting out. Some of these women may come to your practice as well opportunistically to follow up with perhaps they have uh, some other healthcare issues, sinusitis or something they're coming to you for, and the EMIS will flag that these women are overdue. They'll be overdue by at least six months, so it could be any number of months. Um, so you won't have to post out uh, to that male out population. We do that separately. Within your own population, either if it's a telephone or video consult, you will be able to post the kit to them or depending on how you manage that within your own practice, perhaps people call in to collect these things. Um, but that you will be able to do and we, we will be uh, helping you set that up. Once you have registered, um, so if some of you have already expressed interest by contacting the Uscreen email before, you now still need to actually go on to the REDCap link and register your expression formally. So please make sure you do that. And if you don't hear from us, by all means, follow up uh, with the use screen email that's in the um, presentation uh, and, and we will check that out. Um, we will, I just want to assure you that in the GP training, we will prepare you on the detail of how to manage the study and manage the distribution uh, of the kit uh, and what is required but it is essentially um, 
as, as easy a process, if not easier, than your current approach to the delivery of routine cervical screening. That's great. Thank you, Marie. Uh, another question is, can we do site initiation across a PCN? So that is five practices at once. Um, I'll let Katie chip into this. I mean, we're, we're going to be as flexible as possible, but we want to make sure that um, the site initiation or, or the webinar is um, as thorough as possible. So if it's a large group, it can be a little bit difficult to make sure that everybody understands um, everything that's covered. So um, I think we'll have to take it by PCN or PCN basis. Um, I don't know if there's anything else that you'd like to add to that, Katie. No, um, I think what you said is right. We, we were just seeking to make sure that we get the training to as close as your practice's start date as possible so that we can make sure all the relevant staff have had recent training. But if um, it works for PCN to have to have group training, then we can definitely look into making that as, as easy as possible for you. That's great. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions. Um, would that be all, Catherine? I think so. We're just we're just after one, so yes. people may need to leave as well. So. Yes. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, it's it's been really fantastic telling you about um, this exciting project, and we hope that more of you will sign up to take part. Um, please do remember that the um, closing date to express your interest is next Friday, but we will include all of the information in an email over to your practices. So whoever has has signed up from the practice, you will receive the information in an email shortly after the webinar. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, we've just about finished on time. Thank you. Bye.